on Spotify, you can get thousands of podcasts, including ours, plus a bunch of the most popular news and politics shows for free. Go beyond clickbait with new episodes of The Daily by The New York Times, Up First by NPR, The Weeds by Vox, and much more. Just open the app, tap search, type in your favorite show name, and get streaming. Download the free app and start listening to podcasts on Spotify today. This week on Myths and Legends, it's a story from Irish folklore with an evil queen, a brave hero, and a very drunk giant. You'll learn a horrifying recipe for pie and see how story time might just save your life. Then, on the Creature of the Week, it's a very nice woman who will very quickly tear you to pieces if you give her any trouble walking around at night. This is Myths and Legends, episode 128. Give him the finger. This is a podcast where I tell stories from mythology and folklore. Some are incredibly popular stories you think you know, but with surprising origins. Others are stories that might be new to you, but are definitely worth a listen. Today's story is one that I loved when I read it, because I never knew where it was going. You'll see. Unfortunately, there's no background for it at all. It's an Irish fairy tale, that much we know, but it's not linked to anything historical, like a legend or anything religious like a myth. We'll jump into the place where a lot of fairy tales begin, with the queen dying. It was late, and the queen sat huddled in bed. Her body shook, overcome by another coughing fit, as she pulled her husband closer. The queen knew how precious time had become, and she asked the king one final request. He nodded to his wife, the love of his life, who was now dying before her time. Yes, anything. After she was gone, the queen began, he would get remarried. And the new wife was guaranteed to be horrible, just the worst. The king sat up and looked at his wife with a furrowed brow. This wasn't really the time to have this conversation, love. And what was this about being horrible? The queen labored to speak again. She insisted that the next woman would be terrible. An early modern Irish king with three sons losing his wife prematurely? I mean, that was just how it went. With a gentle pat on his wife's shoulder... The king replied that if he found the right woman, she wouldn't be terrible. The queen groaned. Okay, she didn't have much time left. Did he really want to spend it bickering? This other woman was going to be terrible. End of story. Anyway, when the queen died, she wanted to keep her son safe from the surely vile and conniving woman who would take her place. They couldn't be under an evil stepmother's power. And so the king was to build a tower on an island in the sea where he would keep the three boys until they came of age. Please, keep them secret. Keep them safe. The king was really sure he wouldn't marry an evil stepmother and didn't need to rush a construction project and have his children raised in exile. But not wanting his final conversation with his wife to be a fight, he smiled and agreed. Sure, he could do that. For her. It wasn't long after that that the fever took the queen. The kingdom fell into mourning. Despite his own agony, the king honored his late wife's final request and built a tower on an island. He gave his boys a tutor and stocked the island full of everything. Then, he settled all the project's construction workers on the island, too, so that no one would ever breathe a word of the secret to anyone. The young king bid goodbye to his three sons, each under the age of seven, and left them forever on a remote island. What are your thoughts on stepmothers and them being evil? The king asked the interviewee, the beautiful daughter of a neighboring king. Uh, bad? Evil stepmothers are bad, said the young woman confidently. The king beamed. All right, awesome. This one passed the test. He set down his interview note cards and asked the young woman when they could get married. The king had given two main stipulations to his knights and nobles as they chose the candidates for his wife that she'd be beautiful and not evil. The first princess they chose was beautiful, and she said she wasn't evil. So what more did the king need? Immediately, they were married, and the story says the realm was so deliriously happy 
that everyone completely forgot the previous queen ever existed. One day, the new queen was out walking through town. She had given birth a few weeks prior and really needed to get out of the castle for some fresh air. She cocked an eyebrow at the dirty people, accomplishing their dirty tasks for her and the king, when she ran into one of those dirty people. It was then that she accidentally bumped into the woman who took care of their chickens, the henwife. The queen stared the woman down. When the henwife finally connected the dots, she realized that she was expected to apologize for the queen bumping into her. The old woman sighed and said she was sorry, bowing low and waiting for the queen to continue on. The henwife probably thought the queen was out of earshot when she muttered the next statement. She said that if the queen ever came back this way, she'd break her neck. The queen turned around, wide-eyed with jaw clenched. What did you say? Later that day, the queen snaked her way through the castle dungeon to pay the henwife a little visit. To her surprise, the old woman sat smiling, though she was very much chained to a wall. The queen asked what the henwife could possibly be happy about, but the woman shook her head and rubbed her fingers together, indicating that she wanted to be paid. She knew something that concerned the queen. The queen laughed aloud. Look around, she said. The henwife was in the dungeons. If the henwife had anything she wanted, she'd just take it. The woman in chains shrugged. Sure, they could try. They'd been at it most of the morning. But the henwife would die before she told the queen the secret. And this was a secret she really wanted to know. Because it affected her son. By now, the queen stood glaring at the henwife. How much? Now, if you're in the situation of the henwife... What do you really have to lose by going big? So she did just that. Seven herds, seven dairies, and seven barrels of wheat for seven years. And the henwife was ready to spill her secrets. The queen nodded. She said the queen was stupid to know nothing of the affairs that affected her and her new son. The king had three sons by his previous wife shut up in a tower in the middle of the sea. The henwife's own husband had been recruited for the job. And the only thing she ever heard back from him was that the knights were keeping him on the island. He had land and money, but he could never return to the mainland. She had thought he was just leaving her, until some of the others with loved ones on the island started sharing similar stories. Regardless, word was that the king was planning on splitting the kingdom between his three sons. At least, that was the plan when he first sent them away. He hadn't told the queen about that, had he? Lost in thought, the queen absentmindedly shook her head. No, no, he did not. The henwife announced that he must be still planning on that. His new son would probably be sent off to seek his fortune when he came of age. The queen muttered. She didn't know. What, what was she supposed to do? She was still in shock. Pocket, the henwife cooed. It was in her pocket. Grimacing, the queen reached into the old woman's dirty pocket and retrieved a set of cards. Cards? The henwife nodded. They were magic cards, but but not magic cards. If you won a game with these cards, the loser had to do whatever you commanded. The queen was to go to the king and tell him that she knew about the boys and say that she understood. She should be gracious and suggest that the boys should return to the capital, to their home. The queen would throw a feast for them and when the boys were happy and relaxed, the queen would challenge them to a card game. When she won the boys would be under her control and she could do whatever she needed to do. The queen looked at the cards. The henwife had no incentive to lie to her. It was likely that they really were magic. She thanked the woman for the cards and for the information, but the henwife laughed. No need for the thanks. That's what the payment was for. Wait, queen, you forgot to unchain me. Queen? Queen? As darkness overcame the room once again, the queen sealed the heavy oak door to the dungeon. After a day or so, the screaming would die down like it always did. Besides, no one would hear her all the way down there. In a week's time, she'd send some knights to clean up what was left of the henwife. The queen chuckled to herself. The henwife should have gotten the cash up front.
few weeks later, the king and queen stood side by side in the pavilion, watching the ships come in. A nurse held her newborn son, a small, sickly boy, while the queen looked down on the approaching ships. Even from this distance, she could see the young men clearly, broad-chested and confident. They looked on their home with wide smiles. All three boys stood at the helm, each one stronger and better looking than their older sibling. The queen thought about the cards she left in her chamber. They were more important now than ever. Feasting, tournaments, singing, and drinking ensued, and the young men loved their new mother, who showered them with praise and gifts. She framed the card game as an old family tradition in her kingdom, and the young men, having all the help they needed from the wine, agreed to play one game each. In the end, the youngest was the only one who managed to win the game. The queen sat fuming. Two out of three wasn't bad, though. The oldest two would kill themselves, and it would be far easier and less suspicious if the youngest one got mysteriously ill or... So sad. It happened to break his neck after a nasty horse fall in the country. The queen put on the face of a hostess, and the royal family went into dinner. At the table, the older two brothers were quite eager to do anything the queen suggested. She smiled, realizing that the cards had worked. Now, it was time to put her plan into action. Jokingly, she turned to the eldest brother. He was a strapping, brave young man, clearly. He could probably even handle the Knight of the Glen's wild steed of bells. A gasp went up from the table, and the room quickly fell silent. The king beamed. His boys just returned. There was no reason to talk about that. Besides, they were the sons of a king. Why on earth would they go on a suicide mission? But the eldest prince stood, announcing that he would be happy to undertake the quest and prove his bravery. He would do the impossible and retrieve the steed. The next brother stood as well, saying that he would aid his brother. As the hall broke out into lively partying once again, the queen sat quietly, a tiny grin forming on the edges of her mouth. But the youngest brother didn't like this at all. He didn't like how everyone in the hall seemed shocked by the idea of getting the steed. And he didn't like how happy the new queen seemed by the prospect of them charging to their deaths on an impossible task. The prince stood with his brothers, much to the shock and delight of the queen. He announced that he would follow his brothers on the quest to make sure they were safe. But then his eyes met the queen's. He realized that his brothers had lost the card game with her but he had won. It was a gambit, but he said the queen must be distraught that these three good men were going into such danger. Three sons of her husband. He imagined she would spend the entire time they were gone in the tower, eating and drinking nothing but dried corn and cold water, praying for their safe return, and, if they did return, she would come down the tower the fastest way possible to see them. With those final words, the queen began to shake. She tried to fight against it, but her hands wobbled uncontrollably. The youngest son continued. He imagined she was so distraught that she would want to go to the cold cell immediately. At that moment, the queen burst into tears and ran from the room toward her new home at the top of the tower. The three princes were about a day out from their father's kingdom when they chanced upon a man walking by himself in the middle of the road. He walked with a limp and wore a black cap. The stranger smiled and introduced himself as the Black Thief of Sloan. The youngest brother cocked an eyebrow. So the Black Thief of Sloan just told everyone he was the Black Thief of Sloan? The thief shrugged. Sure. Why not? Uh, because we're the princes of this realm, said one of the brothers. Right, right, the black thief replied with a bobbing nod. And what are you doing on this road to the castle of the Knight of the Glen? Stealing the famous steed? That sound about right? By your shamed silence, I'm going to assume that's a yes. The youngest brother nodded. Yeah, it was a yes. That was excellent news for the black thief. In fact, that's exactly what he was doing out here, too. Do they want to be literal partners in crime? he asked eagerly. The youngest brother eyed the black thief up and down. He didn't look like much, but if he, an old man with a limp who introduced himself as the black thief of Sloan, could do this for a living, then he must be able to bring something to the table. Fine, 
the prince motioned for him to hop on. They had a lot of ground to cover before nightfall. We'll see how that harrowing horse heist goes, but that will be right after this. Today's episode is brought to you by Bombas. Thanks to two years of research and development and multiple improvements in design, performance, and comfort, Bombas are the most comfortable socks in the history of feet. You know, when I think socks, I'll be honest, research isn't really what comes to mind. And I think that's exactly what they're going for. When I wear Bombas, I'm not really thinking about my feet because they're so comfortable. I'm focused on other things like writing episodes or how much treadmills aren't my thing or why I didn't bring a heavier jacket because why is it so cold outside all of a sudden? Bombas socks have stay-up technology so they won't fall down. Their cushioned footbed and arch support system give comfort without the bulk. And they're made with super soft cotton, so they breathe. They're like a little hug for your feet. They are really the only socks I own these days. From design to fit, trust me, Bombas are the best. Go to bombas.com slash legends and use the code legends for 20% off your first order. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash legends, code legends and you'll get 20% off your first order. Support for today's show comes from Homecoming, directed by the creator of Mr. Robot, Sam Ismail. Starring Julia Roberts, Homecoming follows Heidi Bergman, a caseworker that helps soldiers transition back to civilian life at the Homecoming Transitional Support Center. Four years later, Heidi has started a new life. But questions about why she left the Homecoming facility force her to re-examine her motives and her past. Based on the critically acclaimed podcast by Eli Horowitz and Micah Bloomberg, this is the one you're going to want to watch. Don't miss the mind-bending psychological thriller, Homecoming, available November 2nd, only on Amazon Prime Video. From the adjacent stall, the black thief whispered, the steed was just over there. He wore a horse coat, or caparison, laced with hundreds of bells. If anyone approached that he didn't recognize, he'd shake. And one shake would be enough to wake up not just the knight of the glen, but the surrounding countryside. People tried to steal the horse so often that the knight kept a furnace running at full blast, every hour of the day and night, tossing in anyone he even suspected of stealing the horse, if they approached. The youngest prince sat back. Wow. They should have discussed everything any of this before making their way in here and wait guys what are you doing at the sight of the steed something had awoken inside the two elder brothers the queen's control had reasserted itself and now they stood and began walking mindlessly toward the prized horse it shook the bells rang and seconds later the youngest brother and the black thief felt spear points on the backs of their necks as they watched the two brothers being disarmed mere feet from the horse it was over. They had been captured. A painful drag down the stairs later, and the three brothers were standing before the hot furnace. The older two fought at their restraints, still set on trying to steal the horses the queen commanded. The knight of the glen was flanked by his own men and an elderly woman. He said that he kept this furnace going under a vat of water, and he boiled people alive who tried to... I'm sorry, are you laughing? Is this funny to you? The black thief of Sloan shrugged. He was so close to death that he wasn't going to lie, so he'd just say it. This whole thing? Just, mm, so cute. The knight of the glen gestured to the vat of boiling water. The super hot fire. All this was really scary. The black thief yawned. Yeah, but the whole point of scary stuff was that you didn't need to tell people it was scary. Honestly, the black thief had been in worse spots than this. The youngest prince shook his head. When people were about to boil you alive, you didn't tell them that you'd been in worse spots than this. Because either they'd kill you, immediately proving you false, or they'd make you regret those words before killing you. But the Knight of the Glen was intrigued. Oh yeah? Like what? He asked. Or, there was a third option. It was then that the youngest prince realized that the thief meeting them on the road might not have been an accident after all. He might have wanted to get caught. He looked back to the young prince and winked. The black thief said he would tell the knight the situation, and if the knight agreed, he'd have to let the oldest brother go. The knight looked. 
He still had two more, and, you know, what was more dangerous than imminent death by steeping? The black thief of Sloan held his hands out to warm them by the fire. He'd been a crazy kid, he began. Hard to believe, he knew. So many good kids grew up to be professional thieves and ended their story getting boiled alive. He said he had already started using the name The Black Thief and heard it one night in the forest when he had ventured too far to find lodging. The sound had come from three witches. The witches were traveling, each carrying a sack of gold, which surely had giant green dollar signs on the side of them. We'd better use the gold as pillows, they concurred. After all, they didn't know where the black thief lurked. The thief sighed. This was super dangerous. But with a warning like that, ah, oh, they even said his name. How could he not? Three well-placed moss pillows later, and the black thief was sprinting through the woods with three new bags of gold. Except, around midnight, he started getting worried. He noticed a hare darting behind a bush, and then the creature kept up with him. He heard the panting of a greyhound running just off in the shadows, and, looking up at the sky, saw a hawk silhouette in the moonlight. The witches had awoken and transformed. And now, he was being followed. The young thief then scrambled up a tree, gripping his sword. The hare and the greyhound couldn't climb, and if the hawk wanted some, well, she was welcome to try. The three witches stood at the base and changed back into their human forms. When an arrow thudded into the ground next to them, they sneered and transformed again. One into a hunk of iron and the other into an anvil. When the third, well, she became a hatchet. For the next few hours, a sentient hatchet wailed at the tree, chopping at the base of it. The black thief trembled with each shake of the tree. The witches were invincible in these forms, and if he jumped down, they would turn into wolves or lionesses to devour him. He turned to the night by the furnace. So, that was it. That was the time he was closer to death than the oldest prince. The night grimaced. <sighs> okay, okay. The oldest prince could go free, but the thief had to finish the story. The thief waited for the soldier to cut the bonds for the oldest brother, and then turned back with a smile. Well, naturally, the sun rose, the thief continued, and put his back to the fire. Witches apparently can't live in daylight? I don't know where that's canon, but they freaked out when they heard the rooster crow and took off. And here I am. The knight pursed his lips. That story, uh, it didn't really have a solid payoff, but a deal's a deal. He told the servant to stoke the fire for the next prince. The thief laughed. That was even cuter. No, that one wouldn't be dying either. Let me guess... You've been in a more dangerous position than this one, too, the knight asked as the servants fanned the flames. Yep. And are you going to tell me what that was? Nope. You know the deal. The knight sneered and looked at the last, youngest brother, still standing there. Yeah, okay, story time, go ahead. The black thief of Sloan shared that there was a time in his life when he was strapped for cash. I mean, thieving isn't exactly a stable profession, so he was always kind of strapped for cash there was still only one time he considered robbing the grave of a recently deceased bishop. Anyway, he entered the catacombs and found the body, and realized that the rumors had been lies. The bishop hadn't been buried with all the riches he'd pilfered from the church over the years. He'd been buried with nothing, barely even clothing. The thief made his way to leave when a figure appeared at the door. It was the old bishop's ghost. It wasn't, but the thief only learned that after he shot the man. A lot. As it turned out, it was another priest who had the same idea regarding his colleague's tomb. And he had obviously gotten there first. The thief picked up the bag of gold he had stolen from the old bishop, took one step out into the light, and heard the clicking of muskets. Soldiers. He was surrounded. The rounds ricocheted all around him. But then he had an idea. He stepped back into the darkness, grabbed the body, and ran to an open spot on the wall. When the soldiers reloaded their one bullet apiece, they made their way into the cave, where they saw the grave robber. Oh no, soldier guys, you'll never take me alive, they heard from the shadowed figure in the corner. They lined up, and they fired. Ow, 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 the figure said with each successive hit. Oh, I'm dying. Oh, I'm dead now. The soldiers heard a thud, and the grave robber hit the floor. They brought the torch 
and found that he had collapsed onto a pile of old rocks that the diggers had left in the tunnel when they were excavating. They held up a light to his face. Hmm. It was some old priest. He certainly didn't look like the guy they saw at the mouth of the cave. That guy must have gone deeper. There was no way out, so all the soldiers headed further into the catacombs to look for the man who had been hiding under the body the whole time. When the footsteps disappeared, the black thief of Sloan dug his way out of the rock pile and ran off toward the light. Okay, that one was definitely better than the first, the knight said back in his boiler room as he cut the second eldest brother free. The thief grinned. It wasn't even his best story. The knight looked at the youngest brother. No, 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 no. Someone had to suffer for the attempted theft, and it all came down to the youngest brother and the thief. The thief held up his hands. He understood. That's why the knight could decide after the story was told whether or not to spare the prince. If the story wasn't life-changing, the prince would die. Deal? With a huff, the knight agreed. He really likes story time. The thief of Sloan was walking through the forest. A job had taken him out of town. Way out of town. And he had been walking for about a day. He managed to take a few drinks here and there in streams that he passed, but he had no idea how to catch or kill food. So he thanked God profusely when he chanced upon a castle on the horizon. Except, as he got closer, no one from the castle called out to him from the walls. The portcullis was up, and he could just walk right in, so he did. And there he found a courtyard littered with bodies. All right, he thought to himself, looking around. Well, this is horrifying. Don't want any part of what's going on here. Time to go. That was when he heard weeping. There was a young woman sitting there with a baby, huddled in the corner. She begged the thief to stay. She didn't know what to do. Her castle had been attacked by a giant, as happens all too frequently, and everyone died except for her and a few others. The giant had appetites, and now she was the only one left. She didn't know where he got this baby, but the giant just demanded that she cook the baby into a pie for him. She couldn't do it, though, even if it meant her life. The giant would be back soon, and she would be expected to have the pie ready. The thief looked at the woman and the baby, and then out at the entrance to the castle. He could leave now and be completely safe. He groaned. Okay, he'd help the woman. He told the woman that she wouldn't have to kill the kid, but she would have to make it look like she did. Basically, get ready, because there were going to be some tears. The thief of Sloan returned with a pair of shears, apologizing to both the woman and the baby, and he cut off the baby's pinky finger. Tasking the serving girl with stopping the bleeding, the thief rushed out of the castle and found something he remembered from his trip in, one skewered piglet later, and the thief returned. The baby was so tired from the trauma that he started to fall asleep. And so the thief rushed him to another room, deep in the castle, far away from the courtyard where the giant ate. When he returned, the pie was almost done. Just in time, too, because they began to feel the rumble in the ground. The thief panicked, but the serving girl said that the only option was for him to play dead. It would be really easy to blend in. The giant hadn't cleaned up at all. Besides, the pie would be dinner, so he didn't have anything to worry about. The thief snuggled up next to a body and tried to hold his breath. Thundering in, the giant took a seat at the table, demanding his pie. The young woman bowed low, set the pie on the table, and rushed away. The giant smelled it and paused. It smelled like swine, not child. The woman didn't know what to tell him. She had killed the kid. Here, she cut him a slice. She lined up the slice where she had baked the finger into the pie and set it on the plate. The giant looked at it. Yep, it was a child, all right. But he shook his head and turned to the woman, talking to her between bites. We've talked about this, but you have to take all the bones out of the children before you put them in the pie. I could choke, and where would that leave you except completely free? Look, I know I'm asking a lot of you. You're not a cook, I get that but I need you to give 110% here, okay? Also, baby pie definitely wasn't filling enough. I need something else. The woman gestured around the courtyard. He had a lot to choose from. The giant pointed. There, that one looked fresh. 
the woman froze. He was pointing at the black thief of Sloan, who, to his credit, was really selling the dead part. The giant rose from the table and took a knife. The thief didn't open his eyes, didn't breathe, when the giant grabbed him by the foot and lifted him into the air. He didn't say anything as the giant took his long knife and sliced into the thief's thigh, getting that last cut of meat that he probably wasn't hungry for anyway, but didn't wait long enough after eating a whole baby pie to see. As he munched the raw muscle, he downed hot wine number eight or nine for the night, and with a full stomach and head swimming, he tied the serving girl up and went to sleep. The serving girl watched the thief as he limped his way to the fire and found a spearhead. He put a broom handle between his teeth, waited until the spear was a glowing bright orange, and cauterized the area where the giant had cut off the portion of his thigh. Sitting back, and no longer in danger of bleeding out, he looked at the cooling spear point and at the giant sleeping it off in the middle of the courtyard. And he remembered hearing the story of Odysseus when he was a boy. He had already cut the serving girl free and told her to go hide in the castle. He didn't know if this would kill the giant, but if it didn't, they all needed to be as far away as possible. He prayed it would work, and as he pressed the searing metal to the giant's eyelids and heard the pop and sizzle underneath, it mostly did. The thief lined up another shot to spear the giant through the head, but the monster was now awake. He swatted the thief from atop his chest and roared out in pain. The thief shuffled away as the giant felt around him. He was now blind. Now all the thief had to do was find the serving girl and... Wait, what was that? Something had stuck to the thief's toe. Hey, I'm a talking magic ring that sticks to stuff, the ring announced to the thief. Hey, hey giant, he's over here. Stop doing that, shouted the thief. I can't, man. I'm an enchanted ring that calls out to the giant. It's what I do. Colder, way colder, the ring called back to the giant. He advised the thief to run. The ring didn't like working for the guy, and when he caught people, it got messy. And, oh my gosh, why was the thief so slow? Of course, the thief now had a limp, and the giant, though he was blind, heard the ring calling out to him. The thief made it as far as the forest outside the castle, and he realized he wasn't going to get away from the monster, not with this ring stuck on his toe. He had tried to take it off, but it was magic. It wouldn't budge. He couldn't take the ring off his toe, but he could take the toe off his body, and he was still gripping the spear point. He found the joint and jammed the spear in to separate it. Screaming, he pulled the toe free. The ring was in the middle of calling out to the giant one last time as the thief threw him, and he plopped down into a deep lake. The giant went toward the sound of the voice, tripped, and fell in the lake. I guess giants don't take their kids to swim lessons because the giant flailed for a bit before dropping like a stone into the lake, where he drowned. With a grumble, the thief limped back to the castle with the spearhead, preparing to cauterize yet another wound that night. Fake, fake, super fake, the knight spat and gestured toward his servants to get the fire going again. Giants, talking rings, please. It's not fake, the elderly woman who was standing behind the knight insisted. Mom, seriously, it's a fairy tale, please. The woman ignored the knight and turned to the thief. She never got to thank the man that day. She heard the screams of him cauterizing his wound, and then he was gone. So... Thank you for everything you did that day. The thief chuckled. He couldn't believe she stayed. He gestured to the castle and the Knight of the Glen. It looked like they made the most of it. He was happy for that. Mom? What What are you guys talking about? The knight added in utter disbelief. And then it dawned on him. He took off his glove, the one with the padded pinky finger, the finger that had saved his life all those years ago. He was the baby from the story. 
Put out the fire, the knight commanded, and flew to the thief, hugging tightly. He apologized to the thief and the young princess for putting them through everything. The thief was right. That story did change his life. He cut the last brother free and took them all upstairs for a feast. The knight couldn't deny his deliverer anything, and so he gave the thief and the three princes the steed with the bells. It was a loud and annoying walk back, but the three of them were happy to be alive. As they neared the capital, the watchers on the wall began blowing the horns. The queen was in the highest room in the tower, unable to stop herself from eating dried corn. She breathed a sigh of relief when she heard the alarm. The boys were home. Somehow they had managed it, and she could leave the tower. As she walked toward the trap door, she knew she'd get another chance at them. She'd kill the youngest one first. He was smart. She bent down to open the trap door, but found that she couldn't will herself to touch it. Then, she stood. One foot turned, then the other. A step, then another. Mind racing, the queen recalled what the youngest brother had said at that fateful dinner. On their return she would come down the tower the fastest way possible. So now, she was walking toward the window. She screamed out for anyone down below to stop her. She was still under the control of the cards. But despite her efforts, the queen couldn't stop herself. The city would have heard the cry from the top of the tower, and then another that went down the side of it as quickly as possible. But everyone was too caught up, celebrating the return of the princes to notice. The princes, of course, went on to be kings after their father divided the kingdom between the three of them. The knight of the glen became the youngest brother's sworn knight, and the black thief of Sloan was his best advisor and friend for as long as they both lived. Full disclosure, I added that bit at the end, about the queen being unable to resist throwing herself out of the tower. The story says she just did it out of spite, but that doesn't seem to work with her character. No one knew she controlled the boys when she sent them away, and she still had her child to think of, and a head full of murderous ideas. But the story needed to wrap things up, and quickly eliminate that threat, and I thought this was a much more plausible way. I want to say thanks to Lehub7, Mini Malenko, Kromana, EJK Wilson, Lacheep, FibroLogic, Tigrana17, IMJ Forced, Steph CM, and Nathan, the guy with Snapchat, for leaving reviews on Apple Podcasts. Thank you all so much. It's great to hear from you. And if you'd like to leave a review, Apple Podcasts is still the best place. And you can find the show there at apple.mythpodcast.com. There's also a membership thing on the site. For less than the price of a bacon bowl maker, something you drape bacon over in the oven to create a bowl made out of bacon, you can get extra episodes, source pack ebooks, and ad free versions of this show that will not add 100% more heart disease to every meal. Check out support.mythpodcast.com for more info on the membership. The creature this time is Hook Girl from Japan. The Hook Girl is a warning for any men who want to harass women walking alone at night to think about their life and not be that guy. Or, if they want to persist in being terrible, to take up jogging because things get pretty violent pretty fast. The Harry Anago, Hook Girl, wanders the streets alone, confident and beautiful. As the night goes on, she'll wander to more and more isolated neighborhoods. Then, when a man says something to her with no one else around, she'll turn around. At this point, with a smile, she'll let her hair down. And then some. This creature has massive strands of sentient hair with a mind of its own, and that is not even the scary part. Each hair tentacle thing is equipped with a barbed hook that will latch onto the man. Once enough of these are in the man, he won't be able to fight against the strength of the hair, and he'll be pulled toward the monster, who, with the hooks, will pull with one giant burst of strength, turning the cat collar into several fun-sized pieces, which she will eat before putting her hair back up and starting all over again. Other than the obvious of not bugging women on the street, there's one way to escape Hook Girl, and that's by escaping. Run very fast. You will, under no circumstances, be able to outrun her hair, but if you're close enough to home and have a hefty front door, you might survive. 
or you'll just make Hook Girl work for her meal, which, after the hair pulls the door from its hinges, will probably somehow end worse for you than being pulled into countless bite-sized pieces. To all the men out there, you shouldn't need a mythological creature that will tear you to pieces with her sentient hook hair and devour you to not harass women. But if that's what it takes, watch out, because Hook Girl is not messing around. That's it for this week. The theme song is by the band Broke for Free, and the Creature of the Week music is by Steve Combs. There are links to even more music in the show notes, and also there's a new podcast I want to tell you about. The team behind Missing Richard Simmons is back with an update and a whole new story. It's called Headlong, Surviving Y2K. Remember Y2K, the Armageddon that never happened? From an evangelical family prepping for the apocalypse to the coders who fixed the millennium bug, Follow their stories through New Year's Eve 1999 and find out what happened at midnight. Plus, host Dan Taberski shares his own story. It's called Surviving Y2K because, well, Dan barely did. Find Headlong, Surviving Y2K in your podcast app, like Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, or Spotify, and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Today's episode of Myths and Legends was written and produced by me. Today's episode of Myths and Legends was hosted and written by me, Jason Weiser. And our story editor was Carissa Weiser. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.